Hi folks, this is Dr. Rob Sivis. I am the Carb Addiction Doc. And today, um, hopefully you'll benefit as much as I do because this is a special treat for me. Um, the person we've got sitting in front of us is doctor, a real doctor, uh, Stephen Kinane, PhD doctor. And um, he's been part of a little group of, of keto folks that uh, we work with. And there are a number of people in this group that share information. And one of the things that is so crucial, especially in the nutrition space is integrity. And um, I think as I've communicated with, uh, with Dr. Kinane, I'm just fascinated by the work that he does. We're gonna do a deep dive into some of that today. And it's just really sparked my curiosity. But the most important thing from my perspective, I have worked on the clinical side as a doctor and also on the PhD side. And Dr. Kinane's integrity as a scientist is so important for me because there's so much speculation and so much, uh, what do you think about this? And we, we pontificate and pontification in the nutrition space has been a huge concern in terms of what I call rabbit holing, going just down the wrong pathways. Um, and as we've tried to formulate some of the questions, he's been very, very specific about sticking to terra firma, sticking to the science that he is most comfortable with, maybe extrapolating a little bit from that, but really on the basis of knowledge, not speculation. And that is going to be so important as it comes through here. So uh, Dr. Kinane, uh, Stephen, if I may, um, won't you introduce yourself? Tell us about your personal interest in the space as well as your science. And then we'll start diving into some of the questions based on your research. Well, thanks, Rob, for the invitation to have a chat ab about this. And uh, I think some of it will be speculative, and I'll, I'll try to make that clear to people, and they can make up their own mind whether they're uh, we're dr driving them down a rabbit hole or not. But um, yeah, I, I, I'm an immigrant to Canada, actually. I was born in the UK, and my parents immigrated after the war. Uh, me and my older brother and younger brothers were born in, in Canada, uh, in Quebec, uh, just in, in the suburbs of Montreal. So that's where I grew up. So we were an English speaking family, Irish father and, and a British mother, and uh, in, a, in a very Quebec uh, a French speaking environment. But I uh, went to, to school in, in English uh, and university in English um, and did a PhD uh, with David Horobin, uh, who uh, founded a nutraceutical firm in the early 80s, uh, Ephemol. He was a, a pioneer in gamma linolenic acid and died far too young, uh, about 20 years ago now. And uh, I did a postdoc uh, research uh, following that in, in Aberdeen and in, in London with Michael Crawford, who was one of the pioneers on DHA and, and brain evolution and, and the, the way we've mortgaged the brain, I guess, um, uh, without providing it with its, the right support uh, and his concerns about how um, the onset of, of uh, mental illness has, has, has really overtaken the medical system in the past uh, 50 years or so, and uh, it could have been predicted and perhaps even prevented. So I grew up in that environment around DHA and brain function and brain evolution, uh, and then took a job at, uh, at the University of Toronto teaching nutrition to fourth year, final year nutrition students with never having taken a course and scrambling to stay ahead of them and, and realizing that despite their accumulation of basic information, they had no critique, the ability to critique the nutrition space. And, and it was very black and white for them. You know, there's either a right answer or there's a wrong answer. And of course, so much of nutrition is more nuanced than that. So I, I tried to get them involved in debates to, to realize that both sides of the story could often be partially correct or equally valid. Um, and and, and in, this, in the process of working on polyunsaturates during my research in Toronto, I, I became familiar with ketones. We might go into how that actually happened, but, uh, and it struck me initially as a, as a crazy idea that ketones could be beneficial and that the ketogenic diet could be beneficial. This was 1992, and uh, so it was a while ago now. But as it grew on me and I started to work with people who were treating epilepsy uh, I, and trying to learn some of the, the biology around why the keto diet would be beneficial in epilepsy, it struck me that we were missing tools to explore this further. And one thing I wanted to learn how to do was to develop ketone PET imaging. And that opportunity came when I went to Sherbrooke, uh, where I am now, uh, in 2003. 
Um, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. It's a very cutting edge uh, imaging center with over 60 different uh, PET tracers that are under production. Uh, and they were very keen to develop uh, this tracer with us and explore uh, what was going on with brain aging because my affiliation was in a, a, an aging context as opposed to a pediatric context. But I thought, you know, there's probably some similarities about the challenges that the brain faces during aging as it does during early development. So let's just see where this takes us. And uh, it's taken us into the Alzheimer space. It's taken us into therapeutic developments with ketones. And I think we've learned a lot about the biology of ketone metabolism along the way. Good, well, that's a wonderful introduction. I just, uh, as I was listening to that story, it's amazing how our footprints have probably crossed each other in Toronto. Um, you were there in the early 90s. I was there doing my PhD in the early 90s. And what's interesting, I see that you've uh, authored a few papers with uh, David Jenkins. Um, he was on my PhD committee as a committee member. And what's interesting about David is that he, um, I think of him as the father figure of the glycemic index concept. Sure. In 1981, he published his paper. And uh, it's interesting that we've migrated away from that into the ketogenic space and perhaps clash a little bit with some of the, certainly the diabetic management on my side on the clinical side with the, the concept of the glycemic index. So how was it uh, uh, working under those conditions where sugar was king, at least it was in my lab and sugar was the vital nutrient for livers and things in my lab. And we really, I really struggled with the oppositional view that more sugar is not necessarily better, it can actually be harmful. Um, what, are you, what was your experience in the early 90s in a lab that was looking at sugar as, uh, or sugar metrics? Um, well, I, I was focused on omega-3 fatty acids. So I had some uh, interactions with David and I ended up publishing, uh, I don't know, six or seven or eight papers with him as a, as a collaborator. Uh, and I think David was extremely conscious about the importance of limiting glucose absorption and by approaches that would achieve that. Smaller meals, for instance, the, the concept of nibbling versus gorging, even if you have the same macronutrient intake, you have a, quite a, an impressive impact on, on um, biomarkers of, of cardiovascular health. Uh, slowing it down. So glycemic index for him was a way to measure whether the, the source of carbohydrate was going to have a, a serious impact on blood glucose and glucose tolerance or a, a moderate one. And some forms of pasta, for instance, can be, have a relatively dampening effect on blood glucose. The fibers, the soluble fibers was, uh, drove a lot of his work. So I think he was conscious about the trying to limit the impact on insulin, triglycerides, glucose, and the cardiovascular consequences of carbohydrate intake. And, and, but he stayed focused on that. And I could never get him interested uh, much in fish. He's a vegetarian. Uh, the importance of fish intake to me was, was primary. So we had certain areas that we didn't uh, agree on and certain areas we certainly did. And, and was he somewhat oppositional uh, to fat, the various moieties of fat as in terms of their importance in the human diet? Or how did, what was his approach to fat in the human diet? Because that was your bailiwick. That was where you were headed. I think he was concerned about too much fat, as most people were at the time. He was a physician, um, and he was uh, interested in, in, in establishing the extent to which omega-3 fatty acids in plants, primarily alpha linoleic acid, could be beneficial, could substitute for other sources of omega-3, and could, could carry uh, their role uh, rather than using EPA and DHA, which were essentially obligatorily derived from, from fish and shellfish. So, you know, along those lines, because I, I've noticed that you've written quite a bit about that, because it seems somewhat simplistically intuitive that if you're looking at the precursors for three omega fatty acids, um, surely those precursors um, should quite easily be convertible into uh, the DHA, which is the important substrate. So I, I'm going to modify our questioning a little bit, if that's okay with you, but uh, you know, the alpha linoleic acid is the one that we consume, and then it's converted to uh, uh, EPA, DPA. I'm not going to try to pronounce these long names, but those are all three omega fatty acids, and yet they aren't 
at least by your perspective, not important. So it, not, not not important, but it's the DHA that's really the focus thing from what I've seen. So the, would you mind simplifying this, dumbing, down, dumbing this down for this poor surgeon? Um, what is, in your perspective, two questions really together that you can talk about. What is the importance of the three omega fatty acids? We call them essential, but I know you don't like that word very much. And I'd like you to tell us why you don't like that word. And I agree with you. But also, why is that important in the human brain and specifically DHA as opposed to the precursors? And how does the brain itself establish adequate DHAs? Is it by creating them within the brain tissue itself? Do they have to cross the membrane? Where are the rate limiting factors? What is the biology of DHA, particularly in the brain? And just the, the one final thing for people to understand, the brain is unique in terms of its protection by this big barrier called the blood brain barrier. And while that's a protective device, it's also an impediment. So if you can help us to explore how, what the importance is and how the DHA actually gets to be part of the brain and what it does there. So that's a, a, a lot to cover, but I guess one essential point is that 96 or seven or 8% of the omega-3 fatty acids in, in the brain is one fatty acid, it's DHA. The brain cells are capable of converting alpha linolenic acid to EPA to DPA and, and DHA. If you take them out of, of, of the body and you put them in a culture system, you, they can do it. The, so the question then becomes, how much of alpha linolenic acid does it take for them to be able to do that? And, and the, the answer is that it, it's more than, than, than we can normally consume. And, and so I say that because if you look at an infant, uh, there's a couple of studies that have been done on, on infant brain DHA levels. If they've never had a, a source of DHA, which is a lot of the formulas in the 80s and 90s had no DHA in them. Infants died, uh, sudden, sudden infant death syndrome, for instance, led to a couple of studies, two, one in uh, Australia and one in, in, in Scotland. And both showed that breastfed infants had a level of, of DHA of about X in the brain. Irrespective if of the, what the mother ate or related so, to what the mother ate? Sorry? Irrespective to what the mother ate? Yes, irrespective. What the mother irrespective. Ate. I mean, it wasn't a big study, so I don't think they looked at vegetarian mums, for instance. I think they were probably omnivores is, is probably what, what they were. Right. So if, if the value was, we'll call it 100, shall we, uh, of, of what that would be the reference, a breastfed infant after all, because it's getting DHA. And, and it's got a certain DHA level, let's call that 100%. If they were fed a formula with only alpha linolenic acid as a source of omega-3 fatty acids, the value is about 50, 40 to 50 to 60. So it, it shows that the infant cannot convert enough alpha linolenic acid to meet its DHA requirements as it's growing. As, and that, as, is, that doesn't weaning. sound like it's a blood-brain barrier issue. That sounds like the rate-limiting step is actually within the neuron. I wouldn't go that far. I think it's partly one and it's partly the other. Uh, it's part. It's both. But it's both. But the reason things. I said that is because you said if they were done in culture, the rate limiting step is not fast enough. So that precludes crossing the no, blood. No, rate. no, no, no. I, I, I don't think I referred to the rate limiting step in, in cells in culture. So it could be the blood brain barrier. Um, but I think what it boils down to is that the infant in humans, the the, the infant is designed. We evolved to have direct access to DHA. It's in the milk, it's in the blood while it's a fetus, um, but it can also store some in its body fat. So while the mother is providing its, her milk, some of the DHA is used to build the tissues of the infant, but some goes into stores. At birth, there's 500, I think 500 milligrams of DHA in, in the fat, which is enough to last about three months if there was no other source. And, and what, apart from breast milk and milk, what are the nutritional sources of DHA as a molecule itself? Well, fish and shellfish and some algal sources today, you can get algal sources of DHA uh, in, 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 in gelatin capsules. And what about flaxseed and all the things that are promoted from the plant-based side? And I, I just, I know the answer, but I want you to clarify that because that's so important. Well, flaxseed is, is about the 60% of the fatty acids in flaxseed are alpha linolenic acid. Uh, 
Alpha linolenic acid probably has some biological benefits on its own, but the, the rate of conversion to, to even to EPA, but even more so to DHA is, is almost unmeasurable in humans. So essentially what you're saying is to meet the requirement of the brain, a plant-based supply is inadequate. It's inadequate in infants. Is it inadequate in you and me as adults where the brain has essentially evolved? It still has a turnover of these molecules in it. It's much harder to be dogmatic about that in, 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 you know, once you're 20 years old or more. But is in there, an infant... Is there any it, place where DHA is manufactured in the body and supplied to the brain outside of the brain in the body? The liver. The liver for sure. So I don't like the term essential fatty acid because it doesn't... Um, it's not nuanced, it's too black or white. That means everything else is non-essential, which is, is rubbish as well, because there's a lot of oleic acid, stearic acid, palmitic acid in the brain, which are really important to the structure of the brain. So the definition becomes really fuzzy. But the fact is alpha linolenic acid cannot supply, even though it's considered essential because it's the one that cannot be made technically. Biochemically, it can't be made in, in the body. Uh, and so that's why it was called essential back a hundred years ago, nearly now. But right. it doesn't account for the fact that DHA is biologically essential during early development. So I would prefer the term that's used for cert certain amino acids, which is conditionally indispensable. DHA is conditionally indispensable or conditionally essential during early development. It's much harder to, to be dogmatic about that in an adult. Right now, I guess also that what we're talking about in an infant is brain structural brain development. We know in, in modern humans, the brain starts growth or starts to develop around six weeks of gestation in the fetus and continues through to about four or five, about a thousand days, they say about four to five years of postnatal life. So the human brain is structurally developing. It's one of the few brains in the animal world that is structurally developing beyond birth. Is that is that a correct sentence? Oh, yes, it's definitely correct. I, I would say myelination is, is not complete until you're in your 20s. And there are probably processes that go on uh, indefinitely, remodeling and pruning. And it all depends on the, the psychological and emotional environment that the person is in. And that process might get truncated at some point or but under ideal circumstances. I'm sure it, it goes into the early 20s at least. So uh, uh, where DHA is uh, a three omega polyunsaturated fatty acid. And as you said, it's conditionally essential as a primary molecule because of the, of the rate of production. Why is DHA important in the brain? And is it important in the neuron, in the axon, in the uh, myelin sheath? What actually so, okay, big deal, it's important. What actually does it do? Why is it important? And what does it do and what does its deficit result in? Well, the short answer is, I don't know. I can't give you a, a very short answer to say what it does. But if what we can say is that if you imagine these are the points of contact between two nerves, what we call the synapses, the highest concentration of DHA in the nerve is in these terminal points where they're getting ready to send a chemical signal to the next one to send the message down, down the line. So the part that's, that's myelinated, as you asked about the axon, the axon, I would say, has close to zero DHA in it. It's like a, a, it, it, it's an insulating sheath and it's got saturated and monounsaturated fatty acids, proteins and cholesterol. But it, to my knowledge, it has very little, if any, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acids, whether omega-6 or omega-3. So the arachidonic and DHA are really in the terminal points of, of communication, where the mitochondria are, by the way, as well, which is one of the, uh, the ironies or the uh, paradoxes or coincidences, if you like, because the mitochondria are generating um, free radicals during under normal circumstances. It gets worse if you have certain diseases, and DHA is quite susceptible to uh, oxidation. So and, and it, does it, does DHA from what our my rudimentary understanding is that the three omegas have an anti-inflammatory role, the sixes are more pro-inflammatory. Is that correct? And is that something that might be part of their role at the synaptic level? Or do you think it's you've published on membrane fluidity as well? Um, could it be related to membrane fluidity and spacing between uh, the phospholipids? You know, I, I'm not comfortable 
it, uh, for me, it would be speculation. I'm not even sure what membrane fluidity refers to anymore. I think boiling in inflammatory processes down to a positive effect or, a, a, I mean, a, a restraining effect by omega-3s and a, an accelerating effect by omega-6s, I think is oversimplification as well. It's not a field that I work in, so I'm a little bit uncomfortable. I know some omega-6s like dihomogamma linolenic acid um, has some anti-inflammatory effects. So, you know, there's the prostacyclin from arachidonic, which is protective. It helps to um, prevent uh, platelet aggregation and uh, the thromboxines are, 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 are tend to promote it. So I think it, it oversimplifies the situation and I would prefer to stay away from the topic and maybe find a different expert to, to discuss that. No, I appreciate that. that. I mean, I, the, the const, it's fascinating the concentration of the DHA is at that synaptic, at the junction. It's, and we, that was something yeah. I was unaware of. So I'm still, and, and as you've said, it's, it's into the spec, speculation realm. I'm not gonna go down that road any, in any further, but it would be interesting to see what exactly it, its role has at that level. Um, and so go ahead. Well, in the eye, which is, uh, I think where it's best understood, it definitely is, is physically linked to rhodopsin and it's helping convert that uh, signal, that optical signal into an electrical signal, which then goes back to the brain and gives us the visual image. Um, there's no rhodopsin in the, in the synapses of, of the neurons, but there are undoubtedly molecules that, that, that perform the same sort of task in helping because then it's an electrical signal to a chemical signal to an electrical signal. Uh, and DHA is probably playing a, a similar role a, a, in that situation, but I don't know the biophysics uh, of that environment very well. And then, and then the flip side is what is the outcome of a deficiency of DHA at that level? So uh, it definitely cognitive development, the development of the infant in general uh, is going to be, uh, cognitively neurodevelopment is going to be impaired when DHA levels are lower. This is easier to show in animal studies because it's easier to do a long-term study and even a multi-generational study. The, the severity of the of this deficiency that you can do in an animal is generally greater than the severity of the DHA deficiency that we've seen in humans. So. Uh, there is no smoking gun when it comes to omega-3 deficiency in humans. It's always been very hard to demonstrate what's going on specifically related to omega-3 fatty acids. Unlike other micronutrients, which we may end up talking about, the, in which there is a, a, a worldwide deficiency of certain micronutrients important for the brain, and, and maybe we can talk about that at some point. But so um, it's it, because the brain protects its DHA, and even more so the arachidonic, you know, it's not black and white for good and bad for, because right. arachidonic is extremely important for brain function, normal brain function. Because well, it's so well lines, protected. Let me, let, me, let me take you down that pathway because arachidonic acid is part of the six omega fatty acids. Yeah. In the lay literature, in the internet, that kind of thing, we get all this antagonism against the six omegas. Can you put that, if you're comfortable doing so, can you put that in its place? a little bit, what is important, what's not important about the six omegas? Well, it's a whole series of fatty acids like the omega-3s and arachidonic acid is essential uh, for, for brain function as well. It's even harder to deplete arachidonic acid from the brain than it is to deplete DHA. That doesn't make the whole family of omega-6 fatty acids innocent or, or beneficial in our health. Um, there's too much linoleic acid in our, in our food supply. And that's not a subject that I'm really familiar with anymore. I, I had some familiarity with it in the past, but we have, uh, with the development of vegetable oils over the past hundred years or so, uh, the amount of, of linoleic acid in our diet has, has skyrocketed uh, and, and exceeds the needs for it by uh, probably a hundredfold. Uh, and I don't think that's exaggerating. Wow. So I, I think it's very inappropriate to extrapolate from linoleic to arachidonic and to sort of blanket all the omega-6 with the same brush or paint them all with the same brush. It's, um, it's too simplistic and it doesn't represent the biology if you dig a little lower. Um, right, is, is, so a, as we've discovered, as if you taught us, um, there's a particular three omega fatty acid that's crucial to uh, the brain, which is the DHA. Is there a similar, and it's, it, it can be built, but not at, at the rates that you want it to. Is that true also for the sixes? 
Is there a particular yeah. six omega fatty acid that is the equivalent of DHA? And does that particular six, whatever you're gonna tell us, is its ability to be produced in the body so slow or so low that it has to be consumed? In other words, is that also a conditionally essential six? And then Very the good. final question is, what's the ratio between that three and six? It's an excellent point. So aside from the saturates and the monounsaturates in the brain, there are essentially three fatty acids, DHA, arachidonic acid, and adrenic acid. Adrenic acid is an omega-6 with the same number of double bonds as arachidonic acid, four, but two more carbons. So it's in the chemical nomenclature, it's 22 colon four omega-6. Arachidonic is 20, two zero colon four omega-6. So they're very similar, but one has two more carbons than the other. There's roughly three or four times more arachidonic acid in the brain than there is adrenic acid, but adrenic acid is always measurable. I don't think anyone has a clue why it's there, what it's doing there, uh, why EPA isn't there. If it's kind of the equivalent in, in the omega-6 uh, series is adrenic, the equivalent in omega-3 is, is, is uh, EPA. There's essentially no EPA, but that doesn't mean the small amounts of EPA aren't biologically important in the brain as well. And, and the brain's ability to manage these levels and to get them right is something that we know little about as well. So there are two omega-6s in the brain. They, they are probably biologically important and because they were kind of chosen elsewhere in the body, you don't see those high amounts of, the, of those, all three of those fatty acids, in fact. So there's gotta be a biological reason for it, but I don't think anyone knows why the omega-6s are what they do in the brain. So, and, and as far as you're aware, they don't have a direct interaction with the threes. They're not paired in any way. Um, there's no, they have separate functions as far as you're aware. They might be complementary, but they are in separate phospholipid molecules. I think it's very rare if it ever occurs to see arachidonic and DHA in the same, in the same phospholipid. The majority of the lipids uh, of those fatty acids in the brain are in phospholipids, which contain two fatty acids each. There are five or six different phospholipids, but I don't think arachidonic and DHA are ever occur in the same molecule. So they, they are doing different things. They're probably linked to different proteins, different receptors, and they have some kind of complementary is the way I would see it, roles. Um, it's not that the brain is tolerating arachidonic and putting up with it and trying to limit it because the, the amounts are as high as they are for DHA, around, around eight to 10%. Wow, that's high. So uh, are they also locally focused like at a synaptic level or some, are they concentrated focally in a different part of the brain or the same part of the neuron? Uh, it's a good question. I don't actually know the answer. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. Can we speak a little bit about, just since we're doing all of this, the myelin sheath of the brain, the oligodendrocytes, the equivalent of the Schwann cells, this may be slightly different to your knowledge base, but what are they made of? How do they, how are they generated? Because the, the, the myelin sheath is so important in terms of signaling protection, signaling conduction. And a large part of what we study in, in autism spectrum disorder, that kind of thing may be alterations in axons, alteration in myelin sheath. I know that's not your bailiwick, but um, the structure of the, of the myelin sheath is crucial also on the aging side, I believe. What are your thoughts on, or what is your understanding of how that occurs? What damages it? What optimizes it? Well, it's, it's I, I suppose we could ch chat about it for a bit, but it, my, my knowledge is relatively um, superficial. Um, we do know that the myelin is forming after the pruning and the organization of the, of the gray matter and, and the, the pruning of cells there. So myelination takes longer. It's why it takes a while before an infant can walk because the signal is simply not getting from the brain to the muscle very efficiently. Um, so that myelination process obviously becomes efficient around one year old in an infant, but for other tasks, it takes even longer. Uh, it involves different fatty acids. The white matter lipids, the white matter fatty acids are quite saturated and monounsaturated compared to the gray matter lipids, which are highly polyunsaturated. They still, gray matter still has a lot of palmitic acid, stearic acid, and oleic acid. But the long chain 20 carbon and 22 carbon and perhaps even longer chain saturates and monounsaturates are particular to myelin. And they're made by the oligodendrocytes which are in sheathing the axon. 
I that's about what I know about it in right, terms of. Right. But that's already. And we know that that's degrading with in aging. Mm -hmm. That that though that myelin layer is is degrading. Why it's degrading? Is it being attacked by inflammatory molecules? Is it an energy supply problem? Um, maybe we can come to that to topic uh, later on. But um, so it's vulnerable, and it's people who do uh, imaging work uh, on, on brain structure in, in Alzheimer's disease have long known that the white matter is, uh, is, is failing just as much as the synapses, the gray matter, which is synapses are in the gray matter. Right, and, and that's, you know, I, I'm kind of leading up to something here because we've got the white matter, we've got the gray matter. They're not quite as separate as we make them uh, as that understanding is they, they feed each other, they protect each other. Um, one of the interesting things in, and I don't know if it's true about the oligodendrocytes, but certainly the Schwann cells tend to have a different GLUT receptor to neurons. Uh, neurons, as far as I know, are rich in, in GLUT3 receptors, which are insulin independent. And the oligodendrocytes tend to be more GLUT1, and they have a different affinity for glucose, but both are require a lot of glucose. Um, can we talk a little bit about glucose as a substrate for the brain? Because this is sure. something that a lot of the people that support carbohydrates in our diet tell us that you have to have sugar for the brain, and that's why you have to eat sugar. It's an argument we use a lot, the di the um, endocrinologists tell us we have to consume 100 grams of sugar every day to as brain food. Now, I, I know that you and I know that's not necessarily true, but it is true that the brain is very dependent on blood sugar and blood sugar concentration. So can you walk us through the science behind sugar, what it does in the brain, and what that concentration, the, what those concentration parameters are? Well, sugar is a generic term, which means different things to different people. Uh, and so in the context of the brain, we're talking about glucose. Uh, and yes, the, the brain needs a, a, about 100 grams, maybe a little more uh, of glucose per day. Right. The brain is only getting, uh, it's, it's getting a lot of blood flow, but it's only getting 20% of the, of, the, of the blood flow. So if we take that argument to its logical conclusion, if it's 20% is going to the brain, then, then your, your biological need is for 500 grams of glucose per day. Um, and, and we don't need to consume that. So why is that? Um, and, and, and part of it's because amino acids can, can produce glucose quite uh, effectively. Um, that's the main reason. And, and because ketones and glucose are in a partnership to, to meet the brain's energy needs. It's a much more important partnership early in development, as far as we know. Perhaps we've misunderstood the potential role that ketones could play in adult brain energy requirements as well. We're learning more about that in the past decade or so because there's been uh, obviously a, a great uh, interest in this field and some of the tools have become available and we're starting to realize that in fact, the brain can use ketones very effectively if they're provided. So this requirement for an absolute amount of glucose may be it's a, it's, a, it's a default position because we didn't know better in the 1960s, but I would argue we should know a little better now in the, in the 2020s. Well, I, I, you know, that, and what's always fascinated me working in the space more on the liver side is the difference between concentrate, substrate concentration, glucose concentration in the blood system and then in the cell itself, in the neuron, versus what I call flux, which is the utilization, how many grams per hour or per day are utilized? What's the turnover? And we know that the brain, at least my understanding, you'll corroborate this or, or speak about it, is that the concentration of sugar is very important to the brain in terms of brain function. And Tim Noakes, for example, mentions that even a slight drop in an athlete of blood sugar concentration begins to affect periphery where the brain regulates muscle function and that kind of thing because it is so protective of its blood of its glucose concentration. Um, we also know that the brain utilizes a certain amount of glucose. Is that a fairly fixed amount that it uses per hour or is it a, a variable, depending on brain function, a variable amount? And what is that concentration? And one other question, is there a big differential between blood sugar, normal blood sugar concentration, and if you know this, intracellular concentration within the neuron? Is there a big gradient? Well, there, there, 
There can be, I, we could start there. I mean, if you just had a bowl of ice cream, uh, the uptake of glucose by the brain is not going to change. So that, that shows that there can be a huge gradient because it's driven, the uptake of glucose by the brain is driven by the activity of the brain. That's, so it that's doesn't matter. Concept, I can just stop you there for a second because the GLUT3 receptor is insulin independent. Right. So, so that, that's why I was asking about the gradient and the concentration. So uh, it's regulated by the use of sugar, not by the concentration differential. Of, of glucose, yes. Okay. And, and, and the, the transport process is kind of the third step. It, 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 on a, we imagine that between the blood and the brain, there's this doorway that, that is the transporter. But in fact, it's the activity in the mitochondria and the ATP that's being used in the cell that drives the amount of, of the next step, which is the conversion of glucose to pyruvate and acetyl-CoA. And that goes back then. So if that process is stimulated by that cell being active, then it goes back to the transporter. It's like the transporters at the, the third stage before, and that says, bring us, give us some more glucose uh, because we've just burned up our ATP. Right. So, it's interesting in the liver, there's an AMP kinase. So if there's a high concentration of AMP in a non-insulin resistant person, that liver opens up the floodgates for sugar. Um, so it's energy driven and it's ATP AMP ratio driven, at least by my understanding in other tissues, certainly the liver. It sounds like it might be something similar in the brain. Well, it, it does sound similar. It's it's the opposite situation for ketones, though. Uh, and we didn't you didn't you didn't. Well, raise I was about that. to go there because if it is AMP, if it's energy related, that energy can come from ketones or it can come from sugar. So the question is, if your sugar concentration in the bloodstream is high enough, elsewhere, particularly in the liver, you're not going to be producing ketones. So because yeah. ketones are not produced in the brain, as far as I'm aware, they are provided to the brain, but not internally produced. And therefore they have to come to the brain in the bloodstream. And if the blood sugar concentration is sufficient, the liver is gonna switch off ketogenic uh, production. Yeah, definitely. And, and that's not available then as a substrate. On the flip side, if there is, if you're fat adapted or you've got high ketones in the, in the bloodstream where you've provided them, if the switch for glucose on and off is an AMP, an energy substrate balance, no, not an energy substrate, but an, a, a, an energy molecule, AMP ATP, then if a lot of that ATP is coming from ketones, would that not also switch off glucose entry into the brain cell? It does, it does, absolutely. Um, there was a point you, you made earlier that I wanted to um, comment on, but it, it slipped my mind, we'll come back to it. But um, yes, uh, when ketones are available in the blood, they are taken up by the brain. And I'm just reading a 1996 review, and, and this, this mentions it as well. You know, it's, it's not just my crazy idea. This has is, is, is been known about ketone metabolism and brain uh, metabolism uh, for a long, long time. So the higher your blood ketones are, the more that's going to go into the brain, and it will prevent glucose from going in. So it's a more, a more preferred, it's not the main substrate, depending on the supply that you have of glucose, but it is... Uh, a it is preferred over glucose when both are, are available in sufficient amounts. And that, so, that's always fascinating for me is how that entry into the cell is controlled in the absence or in the irrelevance of insulin to a certain extent, because the rest of the body, we so heavily focused on the GLUT4 and the insulin receptor complex that here you're looking at regulation by energy provision or energy production within the cell itself. Um, what is the well, mind? Just, just a, a very brief comment on that. I don't want to, don't want to go off on a side street, yeah. but insulin controls ketone production, as you know, and as you mentioned, um, it doesn't control it, their, it's utilize, their utilization. It's the reverse for glucose, if you think about it. Or maybe right. there's some control of insulin on glucose production. I'm not sure on gluconeogenesis, but it certainly controls glucose uptake into, into uh, tissues besides the brain, at least. So right. it's a little bit like the strategies are different. Well, I, I think also that what's interesting is, and, and we're so abnormal currently as a species because of our dominant carbohydrate consumption. But if you look historically, when, when we weren't eating huge amounts of carbohydrates, except for very seasonal times, our blood sugar was regulated very, very tightly in a very narrow range. So yeah. um, 
insulin and, gluc and glucagon fluctuated a couple of times a day, but almost vibrationally without really affecting blood glucose concentration. In the modern era, we've become so accustomed to wide fluctuations in blood sugar concentration and insulin fluctuation, and that does affect ketone supply. But I suspect historically, at where we're gonna go in a second, um, before we had manufactured food where we lived in a food scarcity area, there was really a vibrational difference between ketone and sugar supply. I'll give you an example, my son, um, who's 18 months old, is a pure carnivore and has been a carnivore, carnivore since he was an embryo um, and 95% and carnivore. When we look at his, when we measure his blood sugar and ketones, he's never out of ketosis and he's, his blood sugar is very, very, very little. So I've never, ever seen him out of ketosis, which I believe is probably more of a historical normal for humans. Whereas with a lot of the kids on high glucose diets, um, they often have no measurable ketones in their bloodstream. So, so the, and that, I think that's an abnormality. So as we speak to the importance of ketones and sugar in a certain ratio, that is what the brain has historically and genetically and, and evolutionarily seen since, Absolutely. as you said, we, we grew up on shorelines. Well, you know, I, let's say that the refined sugar was invented 500 years ago. I'm not exactly sure when it sort of happened. It probably happened gradually in different environments and cane sugar was consumed and so on. But the amount of refined sugar or sucrose that we could actually get 500 years ago or a thousand years ago, if you like, must have been minimal. It had to have been minimal. There was honey for sure, but it, it, this would have not been a huge source of energy in our diets. So most of the carbohydrates would have been um, from fruits and vegetables um, and perhaps from glycogen in, in, in liver and so on. Um, and so there, wasn't, there wouldn't have been a big, uh, there wouldn't have been much pressure on insulin as, as far as I can imagine. And, and I, th I do think, you know, while we look at sugar dynamics, it's probably more important to look at ketone flux because as I said, in, in my son, it's never been off. It, his ketone production has never been switched off completely. So uh, it, the levels vary based upon whether he's in supply demand, uh, supply mode, in other words, he's just eaten and he's distributing for storage or for long periods of time, he's in demand mode and he doesn't snack, he eats two or three meals a day. Um, because he doesn't need to, you offer it to him, he's not interested. So the point is that, that um, he's always in some form of glucose ketone balance. I hate that word balance, but it's, one is never off or on. And I think in, in the modern diet, the standard American diet, it's often so excessive that it switches on and off. And I think in your work, uh, if we can use this as a segue to your Alzheimer's brain work, I think that that is a problem from what I'm gleaning from your work is that ketone production is quite often switched off on the standard American diet. And therefore ketones aren't available as a substrate to the brain who, if I'm correct, over aging loses the capacity to use adequate sugar. I, I just want to correct one thing. I agree with what what you're saying, Rob, um, one issue that is that there is measure, we've, we've never had a, a participant in any of our projects that hasn't had measurable ketones. So there seems to be a trickle of production. Are but most of them the in our project, pardon? In the bloodstream. Yeah, in the bloodstream. But most of them are not uh, obese. Um, and most of them do not have severe Alzheimer's disease. So we might be targeting a population that is in, in some way, uh, doesn't have the extreme dietary habits. Shall have we say. you studied anyone with type two diabetes as a cohort? No, because that they would be those are your obvious insulin resistant. We, we've looked at pre-diabetic women, um, and, and but they all have some trickle of ketone production. But I agree that the ability to mount a ketone response is is diminished by type two diabetes, and the ability to compensate for for deteriorating glucose utilization is 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 not there. So the brain is in double jeopardy. It's not getting its main fuel and it's not getting its replacement fuel in adequate amounts. Well, along those lines, and I want to, for you to give the details of the, the technical aspects of your research, but um, do you think, uh, as you've studied both ketone and glucose supply to the brain, 
Um, and, and when we're using the word brain, could you be more specific as to which cells you think is, are important? But what is the ratio? Do you have an optimal idea of ratio of glucose versus ketone supply? No, I, and I think the brain has is, is, is got redundant means of, of getting its fuel, like it has different ways of getting sufficient DHA. These mechanisms have to be redundant in order for our brain to have evolved it as it did. Um, and so um, there's, there's, you know, lactate is a good fuel for the brain. If you're exercising a lot, you're gonna be generating lactate and, and the passage of lactate through the, the cerebral circulation is used by the brain very happily. The brain is, is, is not fussy, so it's opportunistic in that sense. Um, and so to talk about a, a, an ideal ratio, I, I, I don't know what that would, number would be, but I think it would be a little bit artificial to try to imagine. There might be a, an optimal range mm -hmm. um, and that it would be best not to be sort of 10 to one in either direction, but, but I'm, I'm a little reluctant to, to sort of put my head up and, and speak about a specific ratio because I, I, I don't think we could easily justify, we don't have the data to justify it. Right, there was it may exist. I don't have the, the, the quote in front of me, but somebody, some in one of the papers I read had a 70-30 split, 70 glucose, 30 ketones. So sure. I, I just wonder, that's where, that's where that question came from. But uh, you would agree that a very, very low, there's a low threshold below which, uh, for ketones, below which um, the brain can potentially, the neurons can potentially suffer negative consequences. Yes, for in, 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 in aging, there's definitely a decline in the ability of the brain to use that glucose. I don't think it's driven by excess insulin, uh, not in everybody anyway, that's for sure. So those ketones are needed and, and that's part of the problem with, with Alzheimer's is that they're not being supplied in adequate amounts to meet the brain's energy needs. Um, so uh, why that's happening uh, is, is not clear yet, but at least the, the pathway to replace the, the deteriorating glucose uptake is, is there. And can you quantify, you've used this word quite a bit, and I'm just gonna question you about it. You use the word energy and or fuel. Is it, do you have confirmation that the glucose and ketones that you're talking about and the flux into, the, into those cells is primarily as a fuel source, as a source for ATP, or could it potentially be other uses for ketones and glucose within, because we know that the brain does have the capacity for de novo lipogenesis. And um, is that a DNL problem or is it a truly an ATP, a, sub, a fuel substrate problem? It's a very good question, Rob. Um, there is a fuel problem, definitely. Uh, is that 100% of the explanation for what ketones are doing? Quite unlikely. So, uh, in infants, again, and I don't think it's ever been studied in humans, but in infants, 90% of the carbon that is used to make the lipids in the brain is coming from ketones. So that's an anabolic substrate if you ever wanted one. That's, so the that's make very interesting. Yeah. Because if so these there's kids an anabolic are effect formulas there, that are high in sugar, sugar, right, if these kids are not in adequate ketosis, that is a substrate deficiency right there. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. So the mac and, and cheese and apple juice group is probably... It's, it's not going to favor adequate ketone production. Let's put it that way. Um, glucose is also not just a fuel. So part of the Krebs cycle, so glucose goes down through glycolysis and, goes, and the carbon goes through the Krebs cycle and then goes to, what, to the mitochondria. But some of the carbon that's coming from glucose is going off to other molecules as well. It's not all going to the mitochondria to make ATP. What are those other molecules? Neurotransmitters in particular, uh, like uh, acetylcholine, acetylcholine, and, and gamma aminobutyric acid called GABA for short. Both of those molecules are in short supply in the Alzheimer brain, as is the fuel.